In this part, we will look at priority scheduling algorithm and the round-robin scheduling algorithm. Uh, so a quick note to start talking about priority scheduling. Uh, priority scheduling can be of two types. It can be preemptive or it can be non-preemptive priority scheduling. The example that we are working on uh, here is a, of preemptive type. So we are looking at a PPS, preemptive priority scheduling algorithm. We have four processes, P1, P2, P3, P4. Their arrival times to the ready queue are listed as 0, 1, 2, 3 milliseconds respectively. Their estimated burst times are also listed as 8, 4, 9, 5 milliseconds respectively. And we have an additional column here for priority. So the priority is essentially a number, lower numbers indicate higher priority. So in this case, process 3, P3, has the highest priority and process 4 has the lowest priority. So in this case, uh, how are we going to able to sketch up a Gantt chart? Uh, which processor is going to run on the CPU when? Uh, let's try to figure that out. So to begin with, at 0 milliseconds, P1 is going to arrive and because there is nothing else on the ready queue, P1 is going to start executing. At 1 milliseconds, P P2 is going to arrive. And because P2 has higher priority than P1, P2 will preempt P1. So essentially, it will kick it out of the running state. And instead, P2 will start uh, taking up the CPU execution. So it, the CPU will work on P2. Now, uh, P2, remember, it already ran for one millisecond. Uh, for the next one millisecond, it's going to be P2. Uh, then, at two milliseconds, P3 is going to arrive. And P3 has the highest priority, so it is going to preempt P2. And because it has the highest priority, it is going to run for nine milliseconds straight. At 3 milliseconds, P4 comes in, it has the lowest priority, so it will have to wait. At 11 milliseconds, P3 is going to finish. Um, and you, I hope you see that the highest priority process finished first. Uh, that is not necessarily a rule, uh, because if P1 was... 1 millisecond burst time, it would have finished already. Uh, th that is just the how the numbers worked out for this example. So P3 is done. Uh, now we are going to work on P2 because it is the next highest priority process. And we are going to do that for 3 milliseconds because we already ran for 1 millisecond earlier. We have 3 milliseconds remaining. So until 14 milliseconds, we are going to work on P2. P2 will finish. Then we will go to the next highest priority uh, in P1. Priority number is three. Uh, it will. It has seven milliseconds remaining. So we'll run from 14 to 21 on P1. Then the last process, P4, which has the lowest priority, is going to run for five milliseconds straight from 21 milliseconds to 26 milliseconds and then P4 will finish. So that's how we, we will be able to sketch up this Gantt chart for a preemptive priority scheduling example. So uh, we saw two variations of uh, the Gantt chart. We can uh, again do that over here. Um, the There's one on the top and then there is another table listed at the bottom here which shows time and process. So as we are going through this uh, at different times that are highlighted in the Gantt chart above, uh, those processes are going to complete. So for example, P1 is going to execute uh, for the first millisecond. P2 is going to execute from 1 to 2 milliseconds. P3 is going to execute from 2 to 11 milliseconds and so on. So if P3 finishes first at 11 milliseconds then P2 will finish next at 14 milliseconds, then P1 will finish, then P4 will finish. And just the way the numbers have worked out over here, it turns out these processes have finished 
in the exact same order of their priority. So um, that is not a requirement. That's just the way the numbers uh, worked out here. Okay, so we have the Gantt chart using which we can calculate average waiting times and turnaround times and uh, the other metrics we would be interested in. Next, we take a look at some hidden dangers because of priority. Now, there could be indefinite postponement. What that means is if a low priority task, uh, if it gets postponed, then it may, the CPU may never get to it. So if on a continuous basis, higher priority tasks keep coming in, then the CPU will never get a chance to work on this low priority task. So it will keep getting postponed indefinitely, which is not a good way to do things. So a solution could be to incorporate aging into a process. So it, aging is to adjust the priorities as the process sorry, uh, adjust the priorities as the processes wait longer. So if the process waits longer, its priority will go higher, which means its priority number will go lower. And by doing that, we will be able to um, make sure that the low priority task also gets to uh, run on the CPU. Uh, eventually, they become important enough to get the CPU's attention. Now let's look at the round robin scheduling. This is uh, a scheduling algorithm which is related, closely related to the first come first serve. However, it is preemptive. It is the, the preemptive nature of round robin is very crucial to, uh, to its execution. So let's see how the round robin scheduling algorithm works. So it is specifically designed for time sharing systems, for example, Unix systems. So what is time sharing? Well, one CPU resource is being shared by multiple tasks, multiple processes. So we need to be able to do a time share. So in this case, this round robin scheduling algorithm will help us get uh, really good numbers, really good metrics, and we'll, we'll see how. Um, each process is allocated a fixed time slice. That time slice is called a time quantum. The ready queue is maintained in a form of a circular queue. A process is preempted. That means that it is removed from the CPU's, uh, right now, CPU burst. If a CPU is being used to run a particular process, preemption means it is, it is forcefully removed uh, away from the CPU so that the CPU can be used to do other things. So a process is preempted if it is still running at the end of the time slice. So whatever time share or time slice a process is uh, assigned, uh, uh, all the processes are assigned the same time slice. But if a time slice gets done, but a process still needs the CPU resource, then it will get to it later on a circular queue basis. Um, if there are N processes, in the ready queue and say the time quantum is uh, time underscore slice, then each process gets one over N of the CPU time in uh, chunks of at most time underscore slice time units. Each process must hence uh, wait no longer than n minus 1 times the time slice until its next time quantum. So that's a bounded weight. So that's no longer than this number. So if we know the number of processes, we know the time quantum, then we know how long at the max uh, a, any process will have to wait. So the example that we are going to look at over here has four processes the time quantum or the time slice is selected here as 20 time units. The burst times of each process is given to us as 53 time units, 17 time units and so on. So let's see what is going to happen in the round robin scheduling. Let us say P1 arrives first and it gets 
the CPU resource for the first 20 uh, time units because the time quantum is 20. So P1 executes on CPU first for 20 time units. Then it is going to go to P2. P2 only needs 17 time units. So it's going to go from 20 to 37. It is going to finish execution at 37. P3 is going to get a time quantum at that time for 20 time units for, for from 37 to 57 time units. Then P4 will get 20. We are back to P1 because we have not finished it yet. It will get another 20 there. So we, are, we have gone through 40 time units for P1. We are still left with 13 there. P2 is already done. So we are going to skip over that and go to P3. Work for 20 more go to p4 we are only left with four there because we already exhausted 20 time units there so four more time units then p1 p4 will now finish we move on back to p1 the remaining 13 time units get done there so p1 will get to finish then the last process will be p3 which will uh, finish at in two uh, time quantums at 162 time units. So uh, that's essentially the Gantt chart for the round robin example that we looked at with the time quantum of 20 time units. And as you can see here, the, the time sharing is going on very well. Each process is getting some time share of the CPU's time on a regular basis, in a circular basis. So uh, let's take a look at uh, the impact of this time slice. What What is going to be the consequence if the time quantum is too small versus too big? So if it's too small, that means that we are going to be able to share the processor equally among the different tasks. However, the problem is going to be that it is going to make the system slow because we are going to spend excessive time switching between one process to the other. So we are essentially going to be spending time doing the context switch uh, and that will make our overhead time uh, go up, which means that our uh, response times will be slower. Um, so too small is not a good idea, uh, even though it gives equal processor sharing. Uh, note that we must be, uh, the, the time slice must be much larger than the context switch time. Because if it is too small, we know that we are going to spend time just doing the context switches. So it must be much larger than the context switch time. However, if the time slice is too big, then it this round robin scheme essentially becomes as bad as the first come first serve scheduling. And we have already seen uh, the problems with that scheduling algorithm. So let's talk about a trade-off. How can we use the information that we have about the frequency of CPU burst times um, and try to see if we can use that to select an appropriate time slice value. Um, with that chart where we, ha where we had seen that three millisecond is sort of the, the peak here, uh, so most CPU burst will have a burst time of 3 milliseconds. If we compute the area of this part, then that's going to be greater than or equal to the 80% of the total area for all the processes, whether they are CPU bound or I.O. bound. So if we can make the time slice uh, selection such that 80% of the CPU bursts are shorter than the time slice, then that is going to benefit us overall. Uh, essentially, the idea is to make the time slice or time quantum to only limit for long burst times. So to kick those out when they exceed their uh, welcome time. And also we have to make sure that the time slice is much greater than the context switch time. We don't want it to be too small because then, then we'll just keep switching between process one to process two and process three and so on. So we don't want to spend too much time doing the context switch. So 
we have a lower limit established by uh, the the graph here um, and the, the upper limit is based on the the context switch time all right i uh, now i hope you are ready to do the activity for today's class